Hello everybody. Today we're going to take a look at the so-called S3 object storage. As some of you might know that it's possible to save file and binary data inside Postgres or other SQL database, this is not the best option. Um, at least if you go into the cloud, there are better options like S3 storage. And in today's video, I want to show you um, how this is possible and this is the, how this is even possible if you don't have an Amazon S3 storage near you. So let's take a look, shall we? So what we are using today is Mini.io. Mini.io is an S3 object storage that can also be installed on premise and it can be simply run in Docker. This gives us the opportunity to implement S3 without having an Amazon AWS account, which is very nice. As always, the simplest option is to do this in Docker. You can simply do a Docker run command, or as I will do it, I will just have a compose file. This is also in the project and the link is always in the description. So I bring up my system, which is an S3 database, but also a Postgres database. And I log in to this port here with my super secret login mini IO admin. Okay. And there we are. Okay, um, S3 is organized in so-called buckets. So let's create the so-called bucket. There are some switches here that we will not tick for the moment. So a new bucket test. And buckets are very similar to databases inside the DBMS. So now you see, ah, there is nothing in here. So let's put some files in here. So we say upload. And we go to my Schreibtisch. And we have PDF and this PDF. Okay, there is no multi selection here. It's there is. Okay, perfect. And now we have two PDFs here and an image. We can click these. We can get some information here. So we have the file size. We have a uh, unique e tag, which is called the content type is PDF, which is automatically detected here, and we can also preview our awesome test PDF. There is also an image that we can also preview here. And then there is a secret document, which is basically the same as the first document. That's very nice. Um, what we can also do is we can search for our objects. So we can say lower, and now I will only get this. Or I can search for my robot here, and so on and so on. Of course, I can download my documents via the download button. And what's also possible, it's possible to share these so we can create a link and to access this later from a browser or something else. So that's already very nice. This is what we can do with Mini.io, but there is more. Mini.io also gives us the option to create version buckets. For this, we go back here. We say again, create bucket, and we say versioned bucket, which is an invalid name. Okay. So we say now versioning, take create. So again, empty. And now we will upload a simple txt file, version txt. Okay. So this is my version txt. I can say display object versions, which is this. And it says this is version one. Now we're going back. I will change my document, say now it's two. We will upload these again, version uploaded. Now I should have two versions here. Display object versions. Yeah, now I have two. This is the first one. This is version one. And now it's two and so on and so on. And we can do this forever. And you see what this also brings now to the table is that we get a versioning of all our documents, which is very nice because we get this get this for free. Speaking for free, mini IO is for free, even for commercial use. Um, it's licensed under the so-called HGPL license. You can take a look about the license information for your own. 
but that's also very interesting. And what it can also do, but I did not test it, uh, it's also possible to even encrypt the buckets. Um, but there is more that you need to do. So there is encryption that you can enable here, but you would then need to install a so-called KMS provider. Uh, and this is not worth the trouble for me. Okay, that's so much for mini IO. Very interesting. But I think we want all to take a look at the code. For this, I will revert all the things here so that can, we can have a fresh start. So this is our Spring project here. It's important to know um, why we are using Spring here. It's not necessary. So the S3 uh, implementation will work with every Java project. OK, um, there is some configuration here. We have a so-called application YAML by Spring Boot, uh, um, which I did by myself. So we need a bucket name, which is we have objects here. This one is important, path style enabled. So this basically means this is what we need for on-premise. This means that the bucket name is appended to the end of the URL like this. Otherwise, and this is the default, would be something like my domain dot bucket name dot something. And this would mean that only for, for following the implementation guide here, you would need to set up a server in the internet and an AWS account. And with this, we can leverage mini IO. So this is an important switch here. Anonymous file, we will get to this later. And of course, we need to have an endpoint here, which is localhost 9100 and some super secret credentials, which is mini IO admin here. These tie into our S3 configuration with Spring Boot. Again, this configuration class by Spring Boot is something special to Spring Boot, but at the end of the day, it's just using the so-called Amazon S3 client builder. And this basically feeds in all of the properties you just found. And the first time it starts, it creates an empty bucket with a hello world. But you can do this also without Spring standard Java application. You just need this client builder to create a client that can be used afterwards. OK, um, let's just start a small test, test persist object. This basically loads a PDF file from uh, the file system. and it sets the object name, the size, the content type, and calls persist object uh, method in my project here. This is done via REST, and um, it's not the best optimal way how it's done here because the object gets serialized and deserialized and copied multiple times. Usually, you, you would work with streams from top to bottom, but this means that you would also have to use some reactive API here. And for the sake of this demo, this is as simple as possible. There are some assertions here. And now if we execute this, this should create an entry in our S3 bucket. Bootstrapping, calling. There we go, committed. And now if we go here, we should have lower Ipsum. And you see what's also happening. There is a new unique ID added here, but this is done by my own code. This is not done by the client builder, but works. We can say preview. And if we do this again, we should have another file here. Okay, takes a while. And now we have a second file here. Awesome. So, um, there is a controller, a standard REST controller by Spring, which uh, which delegates to a logic class. And there are two implementations. There is one for SQL, which can store everything into a Postgres database, for example, with a repository. And then there is the other one, which is called S3, which just leverages this Amazon S3 client we created in the configuration class. Uh, I'm using a profile here. I really advise you to think twice to use profiles um, 
because the complexity of your project increases and some things uh, might not be too obvious, but for this project, it's simple to use profiles. This also means if you want to have S3 with this project, you need to enable this. Uh, here's the Spring Profiles active the standard here is SQL, and you need to set this to S3 object storage. Okay, let's take a look into the code. Um, what's happening here? And as you already see, these are 100 lines of codes, and this is already extra code. And that's it. That's basically all you need to have an S3 implementation. So we have our persist object, which then calls S3 client put object from the S3 client. This needs a unique key. This needs the byte array input stream. So our data as an input stream. And then it also needs um, some metadata to store it. This is put object. Of course, we also have get object, which retrieves something from the database. And we can also have just the object metadata, which is this here, that we can also retrieve on our own. And as you see, I added my, you can also add specific uh, custom metadata here. So the file name here, this is added by me. Delete, of course, is possible, and the rest is mainly just mapping, mapping uh, the objects from my REST representation to S3 client. But other than that, the implementation is really, really simple. These are the few commands that you need to store, get an object, and get the metadata. And it will work with every Java project. It's not tied to Spring Boot to say this again. There is now this other funny um, parameter I showed you later. Um, while it's possible, and this might be desired to have a clear name here and that we can search for the clear name like this, and that we can also take and preview our objects here, might be sometimes desirable not to have the clear name here. And this is something you can do in this project, at least. So this is custom code, just to make it clear that we can say here, anonymous files enabled true. And if we now execute our test again, takes much too long. It creates a file, but it only has an ID and the file name is missing. And what you also see, this is a downside. It's not possible now to preview. So it seems at least mini IO needs to have the extension here. Otherwise it's not possible to detect and to uh, preview the file. But if this is something what you want to, uh, to hide uh, your data, this is possible, but um, this is basically working so that with this flag enabled, it will not put the file name there. It will just put a unique ID here. What you need, by the way, to have as a dependency, it's very simple. This is one dependency, which is called Spring Cloud AWS Context. And I'm using current version 2.4.2 here. Um, it's important to stress this is not provided by the Spring people itself, because you see the group ID is I O A W S spring. It's by somebody else. But that's basically it. That's all you need to get uh, to get it working. However, there is one more thing uh, I like to stress here. So um, this is A W S S three, and this works with A W S S three, and it also works fortunately with Mini I O. But if you have some other cloud provider like Azure or OpenStack, they provide um, object storage on your own that is at first sight not compatible. So basically this means it won't work. But what these cloud providers usually provide is some kind of bridge mechanism that you can enable so that this bridge mechanism will emulate AWS S3 and then transfer it to the specific cloud provider which totally makes sense because otherwise it won't be possible to have one project 
that works with all cloud providers and you would always have to have a code like Spring Cloud AWS and then you would need Spring Cloud Azure and Spring Cloud OpenStack and it would also mean usually that you need to have custom code in here. So, but just for the sake of completion that you know. So that's it for the, today. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you on the next video. Bye.